Hello, everyone. Let me flash the problem set number two up on the screen. So we talked about the first page. It's a little bit of a review. The problem is on the back. Illustrate computationally that successive convolutions of uniform distributions tend to Gaussian behave in the manner described above. You may use conv, the convolution operator in MATLAB. You may use norm PDF. I deliberately make this a one line question. It's two lines, but it's one sentence. Sorry, two lines, two sentence questions. So that you can use your human intelligence and ingenuity to convince yourself this is the case, to convince me this is the case, to convince me that you understand it, to convince yourself that you understand it. What is your standard of proof that it tends to Gaussian behavior? I do not mean for you to derive mathematically what is going on. I do intend for you to give yourself a computational illustration slash proof in as much as a computation ever can be proved. Okay. Successive, I'm not telling you how many. Uniform, I'm not telling you how wide. You decide. That makes it fun. Number two is, well, quit the uniformity. Make yourself some target functions. Make them up, get them from a table, reuse your uniforms. That will be a little bit uninspired, but widen your definition of the fact that many distributions, when their variables are summed together, yield some variables that are increasingly Gaussian in behavior. I am suggesting that there will be a step in here where you need to do an integration. And I am suggesting that you use a rule for this integration. You know, like don't reinvent integration unless your name is Riemann. Just use an existing quadrature rule. If you don't know what quadrature is as a term, well, it's numerical integration. What is numerical integration? It's for us to find places to evaluate a function and ways to multiply those evaluated functions at those places with, such that when you sum those weighted evaluated places, you end up with a good approximation of the integral. The whole subject by itself, some box cars, that's what Riemann did, and then he made them small. That's what you're intuitively doing, and that's what we talked about with histograms and you know that then approximating continuous distributions, at least conceptually. If your distributions are more interestingly shaped, like triangles or pieces of triangles, or in other words, trapezoid, there's canned rules for that. There are higher order rules. You can do it a hundred million times differently. One step up from just summing constants is the trapezoidal rule, and that's pretty good. Simpson is another rule, and generally MATLAB has lots of different quadratures. Don't make that a sticky point, just integrate. Why do you need to integrate? It's going to become clear, and we will talk about it again, but I'm saying it here first. You'll generate distributions. You will want to illustrate them graphically. You will need to, you, you got to look at it. You have to do it. And then you will need to see that they're going to, you know, run off your page and what's up with that. And so bottom line is you have to normalize these distributions. How do you normalize? Well, by integration. If you then say want to plot on top of your generated distribution, a Gaussian for visual inspection, and then to do more with that later, well, you're gonna need to find moments of your distribution like their expectation and their squared, uh, and the square of their expectation. So things of the kind, x px and x square px, or x minus something else, squared px are things that you're going to have to do and that's why you will need to integrate so to do computational proofs you need a computational engine aka a programming language so matlab that's what i use that's what i know that's what i like to teach you want to do this on your own using other resources you want to go use python please be my guest we talked about r you want to do it it doesn't matter you want to use an abacus um, 
you know, might have trouble plotting things, but you definitely could do it, okay? I care that you compute. I care that you are orderly, organized, convincing, you know, care that your graphs are labeled and, you know, tick marks and all of that stuff. But I really ultimately don't care how you do that, right? If you are um, proficient in something and you want to keep building on that, be my guest, please do so. I asked a question before in the first lecture, so many of you were happy with learning MATLAB, so their illustrations will be coming from there. If you want an intro to MATLAB, I think I told you, take the on-ramp, it takes an hour, it's very simple. On-ramp uh, gives you a certificate of completion, which you should save for when we run out of toilet paper in the next pandemic. MATLAB has lots of resources online. This is a good moment to check that you have your installation done. And I would check that you can run MATLAB when you're offline. That is a thing that you need to make sure, you know, so you're out of your homes or wherever, you have your global connect, your sonic wall, also offline your MATLAB should work. Okay, so um, test drive it. Three, you now know what the normal distribution is. Okay, it's a thing, it's bell shaped, it's symmetric, it has this, it has that, it has two parameters, and it's coming from the convolution of many, many different other distributions which illustrates the point that it's the thing that characterizes little unimportant things that all add up together to have influence. We also talked about summing squares of things and we have therefore the third distribution, namely the chi-square distribution, which reminds me or rather points out to me the fact that this is a blatant lie. This was not the second ever distribution in this class. It's a third because which other distribution have we talked about? Is uniform distribution. Yes, the uniform distribution. We've been talking about it. We've been convolving them. And then in fact, we had a triangular distribution. So it really would be the fourth one. But I like to mention the uniform distribution here and now again, because it is an important one. It's the state of knowledge where you think, yeah, it's between A and B, right? So a uniform distribution, is that a one or a two parameter distribution? Two parameters. Two, right? Because it has to be between something and something else. And you figure out what the mean is of the uniform distribution. That's clearly the halfway point. And you figure out what the variance is of that distribution on a piece of paper some other time. So we did talk about the uniform distribution we did talk about the triangular, but I don't want to be labor this uh, point here. I do want to put myself on record with saying, of course, that's another two parameter distribution. Between what and what are we uniform? And so if you use MATLAB to generate random numbers, some functions of use here, make a different piece of paper for this stuff here. Random is a MATLAB function to generate random numbers. Rand is a MATLAB function to generate uniform random numbers. Rand n is a MATLAB function to generate normally Gaussian distributed random numbers. Rand d or Rand i is a random distribution of integers. Those are all subsumed in random. As the MATLAB language evolves, they add functions and then when they have added too many they shove them all into the same function so if you type help random in matlab you will see a list of about 20 different distributions so when i say try something but the uniform distribution to convolve things together um, make it as exotic as you like so we talk about specific distribution named ones say give me another one just from your daily life your memory your experience or whatever you may have heard just name any other distribution that you know is in your head as existing that people have talked about and that has crossed your path binomial distribution ah yeah definitely i can't remember the exact form but uh student t yeah the binomial Chi square Gaussian uniform. I'm, I'm making my list here just as examples. You just mentioned student T. I like that one. It's coming. We're going to talk about it. You know, there clearly is a whole 
family of exponentials. The Gaussian is in the exponential family. The chi-square is in the exponential family. The student T is in the exponential family. The uniform is not in the exponential family because there is no exponentials at all in it. It's just that flat thing. One more, actually, something that people talk about in earthquakes. You will read or saying, is my photon counter Poisson noise? Is my earthquake distribution Poissonian in nature? Anyway, all you need to know is that there are many, 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 and this is not about knowing them all, and this is not about picking one. It always is about, hey, I have a data set. Does it follow this or that distribution? And the fact that we have named distributions is because somebody says, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to start from a distribution, typically a uniform or a Gaussian or a chi-square. And I said, hey, I wonder what happens if I square that or if I divide two chi-squares together or if I add a Poisson to a student T, what do I get? And if we managed in the 19th century when I was not alive to do this by hand, then we, uh, you know, got math credit for it. And so that now exists. So if there are closed form analytical expressions that you can write down on a piece of paper and integrate by hand, chances are it's in this list. And type help random to get your, you know, pre-programmed set here. And no, you don't need to know anything about them um, except about the uniform, the Gaussian and the chi-squared for now, because that's uh, the ones that have naturally arisen from, you know, us trying to do things, model data, come and square them, that sort of stuff. That brings me back to this here, where I was like, all right, big picture, this is data fitting, right? And, and why we have the normal distribution? Well, it's because we want our errors to be like that if we've done a good job. No structure, just random factors, no systematic is left, you know, just sort of uninformative. Once we do that, we also need to have an idea of what the sum of squares is going to be because that's the stuff that we're going to minimize in our experiment. And if we think about doing 100 experiments, aha, then we have an idea what the distribution of sums of squares when minimized shall be. And that's the chi-square distribution. That's why we need it. And we do that for hypothesis testing, which I'm going to add my arrow here is definitely a subject that is everywhere in science and therefore in this course. And I'm just going to write the word also, right? The null hypothesis, all of science is about falsification, trying to disprove the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is everything's boring. Nothing is interesting. Nothing jumps out. And all of science is, huh, I see something else. I need to reject my hypothesis that everything's boring and nothing jumps out because, oop, there is a data point. It's 32. That's bigger than expected. Ah, well, now you need to have the notion of a distribution and what you expect. And you need to measure that bigness of expectation in terms of how many times its usual spread is. And then you need to assign tests and procedures to do that, right? So that's the naked worm with which we started. The worm goes up, I suppose, out of the soil thinking, yeah, it'll be another boring day. And then finds something awesome and changes their mind based on a proof or falsification that says, nope, you know, it becomes untenable that my null hypothesis is whatever it is. So all of science in one box. Page 24, I'm going to give you another big picture, which is relevant to the homework. That would have been big picture one. And now here's a big picture two. Nobody ever should use statistics and hypothesis testing as the recipe book without testing the recipe. So what do I mean by that? Many, many, many recipe books and statistics then say, oh, you need the student t-test to figure out whether your data is this or that. Or they'll say, stick in these numbers in this package and we're doing the two ways, blah, 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 ANOVA, Fisher, something or other test. And then nobody knows what that means. 
unless you have done, studied, and understood it, which is where we come in here trying to teach you that. As an aside for your um, private merriment, when I teach a freshman and I tell them, you know, tell me something about the weather or whatever, they're invariably trying to impress you with the things they know because they took AP stats in high school or something. And then they give you a table and they say, I did an analysis of variance and as if that's a thing I understand. And then I ask them, what do you mean by an analysis of variance? What, what, like, what is it? And then invariably that's like, well, I don't know because I used a, a package. So everything we do is analysis of variance because everything varies and we're always analyzing. When I say all of that, I mean very specifically, if you think something is x distributed as whatever if you model some data and you have a residual set and you plot the little histogram and you're thinking yeah that looks normal so i'm going to do the chi square test right and is it distributed as you think it is because everything else derives from it because if yes you go on and you build on it and you do inference, you make conclusions, you do hypothesis testing. So if X, let's say, is a residual after some data fitting, some residual error, and you think it's normal, then yeah, you might be doing chi-square test. And whoops, now you're in round two. If you think that your, your squared misfit is chi-squared, and you do a analysis of variance, you might end up with a so-called F-test. And if you're going to use the F-test to do conclusions, you will end up in, you know, your loops of if, then. And without being bogged down into, if you really follow this logic to the end, you will never do a lick of science because you will be always like looking at your third data point and, you know, keep questioning it. So you got to stop somewhere. But whether something is distributed a certain way is clearly a good question to ask. So intuitively, and this is with relevance to the homework, we've got some X's. We've got a histogram of that. Doesn't have to be equally sized bins. Doesn't have to be a lot of bins. I'm not going to tell you how many bins. Generically, you have counted and summarized. That is the definite role and goal of statistics is don't give me all the numbers. Just give me something that tells me something about the numbers in fewer words. And what better than to tell us something about 89,400 data points than a graph that tells me where they're at. And then even better than that, a visual picture of where they're at. So here's my histogram. And your perennial question is, I'm going to do something with this. And so I'm now beginning to think that I'm going to draw a fake Gaussian. Hey, I think this thing is distributed a certain way. And that's a sampling distribution in the making. It's a distribution of a sample. My red curve now is, gee, I wonder possibly what the PDF of X is and you're going to select that from your population distributions, right? From your library of functions, from your catalog of candidates, like the normal. And so that refers to the question, is my sample drawn from the population in the distributional sense? Because if it is, I'm in business, I can do work. Okay. Standards of proof. Let me call again. I want some suggestions from the floor here. Look at my graph and tell me one way by which you could say, yes, that histogram looks about Gaussian. You can try to see how far the histogram is from the Gaussian, like way of measuring error. Yes, I'm already going to point number one here is look at it. Okay, look at it. All right, does that feel right? And now you're saying, well, that's not really quantitative. And now you're saying you're going to measure some distance between the red curve and the blue histogram. 
right? Look at A, look at B, look at C. What is the histogram other than implying that the area of the bar contains the probability of finding samples within the limits, setting the bar edges? So we know that this area by construction, that's why I make it, is the probability of finding the sample inside the little interval BC as sampled, okay? Well, if that is from a certain distribution, this red one, then a good thing to compare would be how much probability you'd be getting under the one that you're trying. That's something that you can do by hand or rather analytically. That's the cumulative density function of these analytical functions. And uh, so that's easy. So here I'm saying, well, that is the probability that a continuous variable now, I'll, I'll say the sample is like any XI, you know, my math notation is horrible at this point, right? But I imply I got I samples, you know, a certain number as sampled, and I want to compare it to X in the hypothetical population between those two same limits. So how close is the proportion of data between these limits in my sample to the proportion that I expect under the population that I'm testing? I can call that what I think it should be and what I have. And in fact, I will. I will say this particular thing, let me just call it S. And let me call this the estimate of S. And so right here in this definition, some measure of error is the difference between what I think it is, what I'm testing, and between what I actually got. And so I'm going to call that, you know, now my notation is all messed up, but you know, I'll call that the BC error. And then of course I have this for all the bins for A, B, and so on. And then you're going to say, well, maybe I want to look at the sum of squares of that. All the intervals, all the bins, in other words. When I say big picture at the top of this page, I, I sort of mean my notation is going to suffer because uh, you know I'm not trying to be consistent and mathematically correct. I'm trying to give you the big picture, sum over all the bins, right? That's going to be some sort of a squared error. And yes, I can normalize and so on. And then you can try a whole bunch of red curves. And the one that has the least of this is going to be a good candidate. And I say, well, here's my alternative PDF of X. And if it's bad, it's going to look bad. And the number I compute is going to be high and will give me at least a basis for rejection. But so now again, I'm making the same point as big picture one is you've decided that something's going to be a sum of squares. While I haven't specified exactly how this particular test worked, but that's what the next homework is about. We're going to sort of assume that if it's big, it's going to be worse than if it's small. And yet, as I said last time, we're going to have to have a notion about how large these things can get. Because I may have a fit, sorry, I may have a value phi for this particular blue-red combination. And I may have a worse value phi, a bigger value phi for the blue-pencil combination. And immediately I see that I need a notion of how big these things can get. If the model's right, I expect my fines to be what exactly? If the model's wrong, how wrong does it have to be for me to reject that null hypothesis? So it will immediately go to, I now need to know if I call this five, for us to judge how good is good, how bad is bad, that's gonna lead to again, we'll need to know how Phi, the thing that I'm going to use as a metric is distributed under the hypothesis that I'm testing. So 
So this example says they got a bag of data, xi, like always before, n of them. I have a procedure for making a histogram, m bins, however defined. I have a procedure for measuring a difference. My chosen measurement here is the difference in the area between the bar that I have and the area under the curve. This pencil really is meant to show the red area under the red curve, not to be confused with the pencil in the top right. And you notice there are a lot of bins. In fact, you better do it over all bins. And you know that you can be above it and below it and kind of want to keep it in the middle and, you know, big picture one applies. And so bottom line is you're going to need to know something about what phi looks like under your null hypothesis so that you can accept it or reject it. Or rather, as the philosophers of science go, falsify it so that you can disprove it. Because according to them, you can never prove anything. You can only disprove it. But that's a whole course in itself. All right, so, yep, you need that. And you are going to guess that most likely you see it coming just by the setup. There will be some sort of chi-squared. But the homework I'm designing for you slowly is to show you that I don't know a priori that this is distributed as chi-squared. I'm not sure if I maybe I should normalize it because remember chi-squared, I don't know what the degrees of freedom should be. I have work to do to show that that's gonna be a decent test. And then I should really test the test because you know what if what are the chances of me proving myself right when I was actually wrong and proving myself wrong when I was actually right? What is the significance? What is the power of this test? That's all wrapped up in a big chapter that I'm trying to sprinkle throughout here, which is the testing of hypothesis. Okay, well, in fact, that is a specific one. Some other simpler suggestions, which I thought also might have come up in my brainstorming here. Some quick things that you could do to get a good feeling for whether or not it is sampled from a distribution. You basically say, well, I don't want to look at the whole shape, but you know, how about I start looking at it? Their means are the same. How about if I start looking at their variances are the same? How about if I start looking at their medians and means are the same, then it might be normal. How about I start looking at the, the, the kurtosis and, and then any of those moments? And I think that is, you know, compare, directly compare stats, you know, simple stats. Now, clearly that's hypothesis testing in itself because somebody says, what are the chances that if it's this way and you have a mean that the mean is out of there and we are gonna probably go about that, that also you know, moments, etc., And that's what you're going to do in your homework. You're going to begin by saying, well, here is my histogram of whatever I've just generated. Let me just compute whatever the average is and let my null hypothesis be that it's a normal centered on the same expectation. Then at least you're guaranteed that. And then your next question would be, hey, what's the variance of this thing? Like, well, well, that actually isn't quite like the variance that I have. And, you know, we'll see. And then if it looks good, it looks good because it'll have similar moments and then your test will check out and so on. I have one more thing that I think is, I'm gonna mention here, but I'm not gonna devote much space to it. Anything else to compare whether a data set is from a certain distribution? Anything I haven't mentioned, I have one more thing that I know I want to mention. Anyone that knows the thing that is definitely popular and if it's not, it really should be popular to compare two distributions, hint, it's often a graphical tool. Are you talking about plotting residuals? Uh, not anymore, but clearly that's the case. That, that is definitely what you want to do because, you know, but I'll say, yeah, we did that last week, indeed. You know, you plot those residuals. You want to make sure there's no weirdness about it, no correlation, no scaling with bin size. That's definitely true. Inspect residuals, yes. I'm going to add that here. Another graphical tool specifically to test whether two distributions are a like, a line. It doesn't have to be a histogram and a target. It could be, you know, a normal versus a chi-squared. Plotting two things against one another and looking at whether they line up. I'll give you one more hint. What if I design a graphical way to compare other simple stats that are percentiles? Now I want to hear from anyone whether that is ringing a bell. 
Are you um, talking about box plots? Box plot. yeah. Ah, box plots. Okay. I'm just collecting words to make sure they will be coming up. And while they look like little boxes with whiskers and so on, they were named after a person named Box. What about directly comparing graphically percentiles and percentiles, or otherwise known as QQ plots, quantile quantile plots? So I'm writing here QQ plot more as a thing that I need to mention to you. It's a graphical way of plotting where is my 37th percentile in my distribution that I have versus the one that I think it might be. And if that's a straight line, then it, they are likely from the same distribution. And then of course we model the distance and so on, and that leads to other tests. This QQ plot is a device that if you're in the right distribution, it should be a straight line. And a straight line is visually very appealing and easy to check. And uh, same here, box plots, I'm gonna make a simple graphic here, right? It'll tell you what's my percentile, what's my you know total range, what's my mean, and so on. And then you can plot your targets on there, and it's got a fall inside. So yes, all graphical ways to do so. Okay, well keep these things for future brainstorming. All of the above you will be doing. If you do any of them, you want to make sure that what you're doing will give you the right answer when you know it's right by simulation and synthetics. And you wanna make sure that you can prove to yourself that it's wrong when you know it's wrong. And you wanna have an idea of the power and significance of the sort of tests that you're gonna do. And it is a messy board, but it's meant to be a big picture sort of association game here. So we're gonna to have to talk about power and significance. And I want to give you the intuition about this as follows. I know with great significance the average density of the earth, okay? I actually do not know it. It's like 5.5 or whatever. But point is, a figure like what is the average mass density of the earth can be known with great precision. That doesn't tell you very much about the Earth, does it? There's no power in that thing. There is no information in that. There is no resolution in that. All things to be defined and that we'll return to, but you don't have to be a geologist to know that you can't pick up a rock at the surface of the Earth that has the average density of the Earth because the Earth is much more averagely dense than the rocks at the surface because it has an iron core. So you can know certain things, you can carry out things to, you know, highly significant many figures that you know an answer to and yet it'd be useless knowledge. And so in the chapter that you'll be wanting to read chapter two or three or four from the early half of Ben Laden Fiercel as posted, you know, it, it, it reminds you of the power and significance of testing such that you double your confidence interval, then you're more and more sure. But of course, your range of values is much larger. On the other extreme, you say something very precise about something really wide and non-informative, then you'll be very sure about that. That's not really useful. Third example would be that you're very certain that you know nothing. Very precise statement doesn't help as much. So power and significance of testing will come back. But I owe you something that I've been longing to do in the next 20, and that is I'm telling you, you need to convolve. I'm also telling you that you should never call it convolute. The process of convolving is called convolution. But if you say convolute, I'm going to start calling it convolutionized. Convolution. You've already had one example. Why would I ever need to convolve? Well, got two distributions, independent. What is the sum variable this year that has? It's the convolution. Integral of px, p of the other one, z minus x, dx. Okay. 
I wrote that, I'm gonna make sure that I have a serious notation. And I know from experience that it is, despite being simple looking, it's kind of hard to grasp, at least for me. So I'm gonna give you a generic Y of, um, I'll just do it like this here. Nobody does integration except by hand or through quadrature. And the beginnings of this are, I'm gonna turn this integral that I've defined as a convolutional integral, which means it has this relation between the variables, a retarded one, a dummy one, the same one, and then an, an independent one that appears on the left and the right, okay? So something that's delaying things, minus x, which is dummy in the sense that it gets summed over and disappears from it, and then you're left with z. So I might go for a time convolution now and say y of t is integral over all lags, that's that retardation. And I'm gonna go with the so-called first function. I didn't actually call it anything but h, so there's that. And another function would be an x, and there's an integration, okay? And so mutatis mutandis, I will have a dummy variable, which I'll call tau, and a survivor called t, okay? I just, um, I went slowly because I sort of want to make sure that that's for two distributions, now I've got two generic functions, make sense of that, okay? You know changes of variables, you know that convolve h with x or x with h, it's the same thing. And then I want to give you a discrete version of that, which is something like a sum over what people call the lags between let's say zero and n because I might have n samples in some sequence. And I'll have my so-called kernel, there I said it, at the samples and I'm gonna call the samples, that was meant to be a K for a discrete sample. Now it is one of the K, so we take some sample K, some other function, delay by K and get N. Top line is old hat. The box thing is the discrete convolution as MATLAB will do for you. So if you want to build your intuition, give yourself an X equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and h called minus 1 pi 32, 4, and type convolve, or rather con in MATLAB, and this is the discrete convolution. So you do want to maybe think about x being some signal and h being some response or some filter or some kernel or some system, and this is all part of the wonderful uh, theory but the word will make sense more later. Now I just call it convolution. I call it discrete. I'm gonna throw the word LTI in here for a linear time invariant system, as in the thing that you're convolving with doesn't actually change with time. So now I want you to think about H being some sort of a response and X being some sort of an input. Okay, so I imagine that you have a, a, a line, you know, in time, and you, you touch it, right? Like a screen, or maybe a touch screen, so now it's in space. And so you touch it, and as you touch it, maybe you, you touch a, a, a rubber sheet or something, you know, viscous or something. You touch it, and it's gonna have a response. How about a, yeah, a piece of jello? You touch it, and then it responds you touch it again, the first touch is still responding, now you're adding your second touch, and it responds, and you touch it again. So if you give it a sequence of touches at different points in space or time, at least keep it you know, in as few dimensions as you need, then your output is gonna be the entire history of you touching, strongly or weakly, and whatever those responses generated are by that. So I might say, okay, 
here's my time axis, and here's my n. And I might start at zero, and I'll graph an x of n. So there's you touching some screen or some viscous sheet or plucking a string or something like this. And I'll draw a series of spikes, a strong one, a weak one, an average one, a pull instead of a push, whatever the sequence is. That's the input. And now on a completely different axis, there is the notion, I'll just call it K, but I can call it anything, of what happens when you touch your screen once or your sheet or your viscous thing once. Well, it's gonna be causal and I keep it simple here. Zero, one, two. And now I'm drawing that response as a function of K. And let's go with the analogy of something viscous that you touch and it rebounds. And so borrowing the sign here, if I give it a unit touch, it goes down, it responds, it comes up, whatever the response is. And then at point three, you're done. Your surface is back to where it was. The temperature normally has decayed. All of that stuff is over. Okay, now that's the analogy. So now I'll say, let's map what we think this response is. What do I see on the way out here? And zero for being the first, you know, that's clearly convention, right? Nobody says I should be doing it. I can start at any point and some codes will start at zero, some codes will start at one. MATLAB starts at one, even though it's written in C. All right, so I'm trying to figure what the response will be coming out of me probing something that when probed reacts proportionally, that's a linear thing, but has a timed response, which however, doesn't change in time. In fact, the sheet doesn't like change as I probe it. So if I probed it once, then immediately I'm getting the x zero times the h zero. Let's say I only probe it once an impulse. Well, I told you it was proportional to the push and time dependent, though not varying in time in its response. And so it tells me that I get this. How about I only do two to make it simpler and shorter? And then it's over. Okay. The system responds and then it's done. Nothing. All right. My axis is changing here. But the second time, the second sample of time that I'm doing it, I was pushing with impulse one, X of one, which is the second push that I give. And it reacts immediately according to zero. But of course it reacts in time proportionally to that same X one. And I know that the second time I got my response H one. I'm gonna do one more. And I want you to be with me here, right? So now I'm pushing the third time. And I know the response is linear, proportional. And the first thing it hears is the H0. And the second thing that comes out is the H1. Now I do mean these things to be multiplied. And I do thereby mean what I have been saying, I have a sequence of pushes, X of zero, one, two, three. Every one of them reacts and every one, whenever it is pushed at one or two, generates the traditional response of H zero and H one proportionally to it being pushed. And so if I ask myself what comes out at the other end, then I'm gonna write the Y of N here as the response, and I really will only need a few more minutes. And N is sort of running down here because at N equals one, I'm just getting X zero, H zero. 
the first response of the first push and nothing else has been pushed. And at n equals two, I'm getting the lingering response of the first push with the incipient response of the second push. n equals to zero, n equals one, the second one. And so on the third one is x1, the lingering response of the second push, the incipient response of the third push, add it together. And so on until infinity. So multiplying these things, that's a sort of proportional response. That's the linearity. And add, I'm not sure how to illustrate it other than that, the brackets are multiplying and the effects are combined. Actually, I don't know how to do it. I'll just make it like this. Those things are now summed. So it works best if you draw this with three, I think. I ran out of space a little bit. But if you write this, and then now you go back and say, well, what have I just done? Why then the response of the thing where the system is driven by X, a series of impulses, and responding with a reaction that is time dependent, but the reaction itself is time invariant in its time dependent. Y of zero is going to have to be H of zero times X of zero. And you can't further subtract anything. But now, ooh, my two things on my camera, right? So Y of one needs to be X of one minus zero times eight zero plus x of one minus one, which is zero, times x one, and so on. So when you read on the Wikipedia the convolution or you open it in standard textbook, it has these things about, oh, you got to flip and integrate, and that's this graph that you will see. Wikipedia convolution. This is the graph that I have in mind. Make of it what you will. I find this more confusing than what I've tried to do for you here. Co correlation we're going to get. That's easy. Convolution, it's sort of backwards. And you got to read it like this and go like, where does it come from? Visual explanation, I get it. But the whole flipping, and I don't get it. So this is what happens. I think if you can imagine you pushing something that has a delayed response, which however, and its delay doesn't change over time, which means it's linear is proportional, it's time invariant, and you construct yourself a sequence of this and responses, and then you walk yourself through what happens, and then you sum the results, you will have constructed your discrete convolution. I don't know how any of this relates to the probability convolution that we have. We, we didn't need a physical notion of this being true, we just said sum, but of course it's related because it's linear time invariant systems. Um, but so that's a physical intuition that you get for what convolution means so that you can make sense of your numbers. And believe me, you'll convolve a lot in your career. And many of you will deconvolve a lot. And thanks to today, none of you will ever say convolute or deconvolute. Next week, be expecting that we may actually go into MATLAB right away. I would say the most productive use of your time is to try and look at the problem set now and see where you would go with that.